Hello, brethren. My name is Paul Little. I'm from Blazing Star Eureka, Lodge Number 11 in Concord, New Hampshire. I'm the current uh, junior warden, and I'm from the Valley of Concord here in New Hampshire, and I'm junior warden for the Rose Croix line as well. Pleasure to meet you all. Paul is a is a reasonably new Mason. He was raised in uh, 2012 and joined Scottish Rite in 2014. And uh, something that I learned about Paul today that I didn't know before is that he attended Berkeley School of Music uh, in Boston and for a while worked on a cruise line as a, as a musician. Uh, and I, I can imagine that offline we can probably tell some interesting stories about that experience. <laughs> Very true. Those would have to be offline conversations. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start sharing my presentation at this point, so you won't see me, but you'll see the presentation start. Um, while I'm getting that ready, I'm going to thank you all for, you know, allowing me to partake in this first historic um, situation that we have here with the North and the South. Uh, okay. So... What I was asked to do, I've, I've given this presentation at our own Blue Lodge here in New Hampshire a couple of times. I've spiffed it up a little bit for you guys here for the, for the, for the North and the South meeting that we have. Um, as Ken just mentioned, you know, I've been in division for many years, so that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, one of the things I'd like to talk about is music in the liberal arts. Music is part of us. Our heartbeat is the basic pattern with the sounds ranging from a baby's first cry to our last breath. The sense of hearing is improved so that we recognize ditties and rhythms and syncopation. Clapping and singing comes naturally to every single one of us. Some of us might not just sing as good as others, but it does come naturally to every one of us. The senior warden is sometimes associated with this science of music, as the warden asks for harmony in the lodge. Music is the sixth of the liberal arts and is categorized as one of the sciences of the quadrivium. Quadrivium means four of the liberal arts. That consists of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. But why would music be grouped together as a science like arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy? To learn the answer to that, we want to look to our ancient brother, Pythagoras. Music is a mystery to the Freemason and a mystery as to its connection to mathematics. But to anyone who practices this art, the connection is apparent. Our ancient brother, Pythagoras, was perhaps the first to notice the mathematic correlation between music and numbers. It is said that Pythagoras discovered that the sounds from his stringed instruments depended upon their lengths. He further found that putting multiple strings together allowed him to produce a pleasing harmony. His inquiring mind led him to believe and discover that the ratio of the lengths of the strings were simple whole numbers. Although it is said that he himself was not a musician, Pythagoras is not surely credited with the discovery of the diatonic scale, which to all of us is do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, which I'll play for you. Pythagoras thereupon discovered that the first and fourth strings, when sounded together, produced the harmonic interval of the octave. For doubling the weight of, of the same effect, doubling the weight of the string has the same effect as halving the string. The tension of the first string being twice that of the fourth string. The ratio was said to be two to one. By similar experimentation, he ascertained that the first and the third string produced a harmonic of the interval of the fifth. 
tension of the first string being half again as much as that of the third string, their ratio was said to be three to two. He also went further and discovered that the second and the fourth strings, having the same ratio as the first and third, yielded the diapent harmony, which is the interval of a fifth. So continuing his investigation, Pythagoras discovered that the first and second strings produced a harmony of the diatassaron, or the, set, the interval of a third. And the tension of the first string being a third greater than that of the second string, that ratio is said to be four to three. Now that's a lot of information to throw, you know, a lot of big numbers, a lot of everything, but what he basically just did was he, he looked at the ratios on the strings and he made a basic major scale and figured out that they were all whole numbers on the, 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 the most important part of music, which is the major scale in a major chord. So, in the Pythagorean concept of music of the spheres, the interval between the Earth and the sphere of the fixed stars was considered to be a diapason, which again, on the previous slide, was the interval of a third, the most perfect harmonic interval. The allowing arrangement is most generally accepted for the musical intervals of the planets between Earth and the sphere of the fixed stars. From the sphere of the Earth to the sphere of the Moon, one tone. From the sphere of the Moon to that of Mercury, one half tone. From Mercury to Venus, one half. From Venus to the Sun, one and a half tones. From the Sun to Mars, one tone. From Mars to Jupiter, one half tone. From Jupiter to Saturn, one half tone. And from Saturn to the fixed stars, another half tone. The sum of these intervals equals the six whole tones of the octave. Pythagoras said, there is geometry in the humming of strings. There is music in the spacing of the spheres. To Pythagoras, music was one of the dependencies of the divine science of mathematics, and its har harmonies were inflexibly controlled by mathematical proportions. The Pythagoreans averred that mathematics demonstrated the exact method by which the good established and maintained its universe. Numbers, therefore, preceded harmony since it was the immutable law that governs all harmonic proportions. Having once established music as an exact science, Pythagoras applied his newly found law of harmonic intervals to all the phenomena of nature, even going so far as to demonstrate the harmonic relationship of the planets, constellations, and elements to each other. A notable example of modern corroboration of ancient philosophical reaching is that of the progression of the elements according to harmonic ratios. When making a list of the elements in ascending order of their atomic weight, John A. Newton discovered at every eighth element, element a distinct repetition of properties. This discovery is today known as the law of octaves in modern chemistry. So, from the time of Pythagoras, the study of music was regarded as mathematical in nature. It seems strange to think of music as mathematical until one considers the words of the philosopher and mathematician Gottfried Leibniz, who said, music is the pleasure the human soul experiences from counting without being aware that it is counting. It was this essential mathematical character of music that leads to its being included in to the quadrivium amongst all those mathematical sciences. Before I go on to the second half, is there any questions? Mm -hmm.
Now, as we're talking of music, one of our most notable, maybe not notable, influences that we have had in music, some people may or may not know, that Mozart, whose full name was Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, was a mason. But before we go into his Masonic career, uh, we want to talk about Mozart, you know, you know, from his early childhood and so forth. You know, it's well known, well documented that Mozart, you know, he was a child prodigy of music. At the age of four, he learned to play eight minuets. By the age of six, he was an accomplished performer on the keyboard, organ, and violin, and had composed five short piano pieces, all of which are still frequently played today. In 1784, at the age of 28, Mozart was initiated into Zerwaldtagait, which translates to Beneficence, Lodge in Vienna. The date was December 14, 1784. It's not known when he was passed or when he was raised, but it has been recorded that he did become a Master Mason and that he was in regular attendance at the Lodge. His father-in-law and his brother-in-law were also members, but they were members at a different lodge. Later on in life, his father, Leopold, also became a mason as well, and I believe that was at his lodge in Vienna while he was visiting. Mozart has made many contributions to masonry. Um, he's made many works. He cantata di mora frut which is the Mason's Joy, composed in 1785. The Borderish Prav music, which is the Masonic funeral music for Lodges of Sorrow, also composed in 1785. The Symphonies number 39 and 41. The Clarinet Quintet and the Clarinet Concerto. The Requiem Mass. And the opera La Clemenza de Tito, all had Masonic overtones and influences to them. The Ein Klein Frugmeier, which was Mozart's last completed work and completed on his last visit to his lodge, which was a month before his death. Mozart did enjoy his Freemasonry at a time when the craft in Austria was very strong, it was growing, and it was, but it was protected by the benevolent emperor, Joseph II. Joseph II was well aware that several of his most trusted friends and several of his cabinet members were also members of the craft. But Mozart, as he was nearing the end of his days, Freemasonry in Austria was also coming to its own demise in Austria. Now, there was one more piece of important work that Mozart had, did compose for Freemasonry, but before I lead into that, I think it's important that we take a look at the years preceding Mozart and Emperor Joseph II to understand the feel and the tone of the years. Because when Emperor Joseph was in reign, you know, that was the, that was the age of enlightenment. But the years preceding that told a lot, and it drove a lot of the culture in Austria-Vienna. So we go back to 1731. Francis, who was the Duke of Lorraine, was initiated, passed, and raised as a master mason. Francis, by the way, was Joseph II's father. In 1738, which was the year that the Duke of Lorraine, Francis, married his wife, Maria Teresa. But the same year, Pope Clement issued a papal bull in which Freemasonry was condemned on a number of grounds that we all know. In 1740, Maria succeeded the throne to Francis, which yielded a situation whereby a Freemason was the joint ruler of a vast empire with his spouse, who, by the way, she was fiercely anti-Freemasonry. In 1742, 
Francis was instrumental in the formation of Austria's first Masonic Lodge, Dry Cannonin, which translates to three cannons. A year later, 1943, the lodge was broken up by a detachment of 100 grenadiers. 30 lodge members were in attendance. Francis managed to escape through a back stairwell and later secured the release of 12 of his brethren and the rest were all later released. The suppression, the suppressions of the Free Cannons Lodge was a disaster for the Freemasons of Austria, but the lodge survived struggling in secrecy. Francis dies in 1765 and he was replaced as co-regent by his son, Joseph II. Joseph II was an avid reformer in the very epitome of the Age of Enlightenment. Following the death of his mother, Maria Theresa, in 1780, Freemasonry entered the Great and the Grand Lodge of Austria was formed in 1780. Amidst all of this, Emperor Joseph's sister, Marie Antoinette, was in the beginning stages of a re revolution in her empire over in France. Which This is a revolution of which several accounts point towards Freemasonry having his hand in Sparta. So in 1785, under pressure from the church, Joseph issued an edict restricting the number of lodges to three in any one city. And as a result of that, only three of 45 that existed survived. In that same year, with all of this transition happening, all the turmoil and shifting going on in Austria regarding masonry, Mozart composed with his good friend and another brother from his lodge, Schigenator, what may be his most deliberate and obvious work for Masonry. This was the opera, The Magic Flute. Again, written by Mozart, while it makes no reference directly to Masonry, but it has always been accepted as a Masonic opera. Musicians assert that even the music has much significance, beginning with the three solemn chords played from the brass section at the start of the opera, which I'm going to show you right now. So the opera continues on, it goes on its merry way, the pace picks up a little bit, but it's important to note the significance of the three tonal chords at the very beginning of the of this opera. It happens repeatedly. And as we all know, number three is a very important number with us. Mozart and Schigenator, they constantly play the number of threes throughout the entire overture and repeatedly through the entire opera. Number three is a very prominent number. Any Mason in 1785 that would have attended this opera would have clearly recognized all the Masonic symbols and signs and general overtone theme within this opera. opera. This is what we would consider today, you know, some of the books written by Dan Brown where it's maybe not related to Masonry, but the overtone is there. But this was clearly a Masonic the overture itself is written in the key of E flat. The key of E flat has three, again the number of three, flats that are seemingly placed in a similar pattern to the three lights around our altar. Also, these flats resemble the lights themselves as they're shaped like candles. It's important to note that the Masonic funeral music that Mozart wrote was also written in the same key of E-flat. The key of E-flat has been considered in, in musical history the Masonic key. 
because of because of the symbolism and the, the shape and pattern of the flaps on the staff. However, through the, all the musical references in the Magic Flute, they didn't stop there. The, the, the libretto or the plot of the opera itself was also full of Masonic references. The opera opens with a young prince by the name of Tamino. He's being chased through the woods by a large serpent. He is later rescued by three, again, number three, three ladies who serve as the queen of the night, who represents darkness. The queen has a daughter by the name of Pamina, who has been kidnapped by the evil Sarastra. The queen asks Tamino to rescue her and sends her bird catcher, Papagino, along to help. So off they go, Papagino and Tamino, to try to rescue her and to find her. They kind of go through the woods, they separate their ways for a bit. Papagino, in kind of a funny scene, stumbles upon Monastatos, who seems about to rape Tamina, and they, it's, it's a funny scene because they kind of scare each other. But meanwhile, Tamino, he's been found and guided by three boys. So again, we have the number three happening. Three boys who are genii, and they lead him to a temple which has three doors, one of which is marked Wisdom. <clears throat> when Tamina was standing outside the temple awaiting admission, the evil Sarastro says to the priests, Tamino, son of a king, is wandering by the north gate of our temple and wishes to divest himself of his veil, assumably the hoodwink, and look into the shrine of the great light. This is a clear reference to the Masonic dark in the north, as well as from moving from dark to light. Tamino is told that in order to find Pamina, he must first join the temple's holy order, and to do so, he must first endure their rituals of purification, and then he's led into the temple. It's interesting to note that inside the temple, there are 18 priests sitting at 18 chairs, which is a rather perfect form of three, six times three. The entire second act of the opera centers around the rituals of purification that Tamino and Papagino must undergo as they move from darkness to light. At several places in the act, not only musically do we repeatedly hear those three tonal chords in various sounds and spots through the entire music, help and guidance are given by the same three boys, representing the genii, who would presumably elude, because remember we're going through the rituals of purification, they allude to the officers of the lodge who take charge of the candidate as we go through our rituals. The trials that they undergo are direct allusions to wisdom virtue, fortitude, patience, and charity, and the other virtues, which is so much the subject of the Masonic ritual that we undergo. I highly recommend, um, I mean, that completes most of my presentation here, other than questions. Um, there is a lot online to look up uh, for the Masonic, Magic Flute, Mozart, it's very steeped in tradition, and as I mentioned, it is, it is known as the Masonic Opera. If anyone has any questions, I welcome them. Otherwise, I thank you for, for listening. Well, Paul, I don't think there's much question. We got our money's worth. <coughs> thank you so much. Um, does does anyone here in the room have anything that they'd like to ask or a comment they'd like to make? Yes, David, come on, come on over here so that so that uh, the guys back there will be able to see and hear you properly. How old was Mozart when he died? Do you happen to know that by any chance? 
No, I don't. He was very young. I think he was he was either thirty six, I believe, and he died of the rheumatic fever. Oh, thank you very much. I believe Mozart was thirty nine when he died. Was he thirty nine? No, no. I believe he was thirty nine when he died, and uh, he had rheumatic fever as a child, but he had caught an influenza at the end of his life that exacerbated I'm a retired physician the vegetation on the heart valves became inflamed because of that influenza and he basically drowned in his own fluid by when his lungs filled up but I believe he was 39 the movie Amadeus portrays it beautifully they do except they put a little bit of twist on it where they portray that he was murdered which is not which no, is on no, several no, accounts no, then kind no, no. of Mozart, Mozart was not murdered. Mozart no, died a natural death. That's right. And very few people know that Mozart was a mason, and very few people know that the magic flute is the Masonic opera. Yes. Uh, brother. Uh, bro brother. Is it Brother Neil? Yes. Um, you, you apparently have just joined us, and, and frankly, I don't believe I know you. Could you introduce yourself? My, which name, which introduction? My name, is, my name is Neil Kenny. I was raised in Marshall Maimonides Lodge, 7th Manhattan, in 1968. I have affiliated with St. Peter's Lodge in Bradford. I have just joined the Scottish Rite. I have just joined the Shrine, and my Masonic line goes back to uh, 1760. Well, welcome, and and we're we're so glad that you joined us, and I'm and also unfortunately tied up and couldn't get. I wish there was a some place where this could be repeated and I could watch from the beginning. Well, I I hope we're recording this. If if my good friend Ed Lewis did his job back there. Hello, Ed. I see that it's recording. Okay, great. <laughs> so the, the answer is yes, you and a lot of other people are interested in seeing this who couldn't be here tonight, and we intend to make it available. The uh, High Country Club has a YouTube channel, and we intend to uh, do some editing, hopefully, to... Uh, to clean this up a little bit and then make the whole uh, program, including the beginning before we actually had Paul begin his presentation, uh, available for people to be able to see. Ed, Ed, can you hear me? Ed, it's Neil. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. And if I unmute my mic, you can probably hear me better, too. Yes, I love that white beard of yours. You look like a Billy Goat Gruff. Will you uh, be kind enough to let me know when this is going to be available? Uh, Ken, yeah, Ken will be putting that out. Okay, so but, uh, but through the uh, through the valley, we should. I, well, I'll, I'll see you at the valley all the time anyway. You can just tell me where I can get my hands on it. Uh, we'll put it on the uh, Facebook uh, for the Valley of Concord, so anybody can pick it up. Great. <coughs> okay, anybody here in Arizona have any questions? Hardy, this was right up your alley. Do you have anything you want to add? Oh, it sure is. Okay, well, come on over here and sit so we can get the guys that can see you and, and, and hear you. Hi, I'm Hardy Rose, and if you'll forgive me, I'm a saxophone and clarinet player. Uh, uh, I, I saw... This opera performed in, in the, by the Met in New York City, and the curtain that was visible, of course, to the audience during the overture was covered with maybe 30 or 40 Masonic symbols. Now, if you don't realize that there's that many, I didn't realize that there were that many Masonic symbols, but it was interesting. So it was pretty obvious to anybody who had any knowledge at all of masonry that this was a Masonic uh, opera. 
after that, of course, it, everything just went on. But it's a wonderful thing. I, you know, as I as I said in the presentation, I think it's very important. You know, at the time that this was written, with everything that was happening, you know, over in France with the Freemasons and over in Austria, this was it was a very bold move of Mozart to write this, and uh, it was very brave of him to do. Hey, does anybody else here in the room have any questions or want to make a comment? I just, if I may. I just wanted to comment that the more research I do, and now that I'm to the point in my life that I have the time to do it, I, I'm doing it. Masonry is throughout so many different paradigms that people don't even understand or begin to fathom the impact that Freemasonry has had on civilization. Forget the revolution, forget the French Revolution, forget the magic flute, forget Washington and the laying out of Washington. I mean, just on civilization. Uh, the people that have impacted this world, for the most part, have been Masons. And it's a heritage that the older I get, the prouder I become of it. As I said, my lineage goes back to 1760 as far as masonry goes. Well, thank you, brother, for, for your comments and, and your uh, good words that enlightened us about some stuff that maybe the rest of us didn't know. I, I have um, one one comment and then we'll kind of wrap things up here as far as letting people uh, who haven't said much uh, have their say and uh, so forth. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you guys back in New Hampshire know this is the 150th anniversary of Axeland's Lodge, uh, uh, of the founding of Axeland Lodge. And as a result of that, we're going to be uh, presenting, uh, already have presented a number of functions celebrating uh, that 150th anniversary. Uh, it will be talked off uh, in, on October 15th uh, with a, a gala that's being held at one of the uh, local resorts here uh, where we expect uh, there will be a number of <coughs> Masonic personalities uh, including the Grand, uh, Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of California because uh, Axeland Lodge was formed uh, under a dispensation from the Grand Lodge of California because it actually predated the formation of the Grand Lodge of Arizona. So that evening, uh, the gala will include, obviously, a number of tributes to the history uh, of the lodge, but it is also going to include uh, a performance of portions of the magic flute, which is why I asked Paul to try to emphasize uh, some of these things, because many of us, myself included, um, were have we'd heard of the magic flute, and the Masonic opera. We didn't really know much about what it was about, and didn't know much about the Masonic symbolisms. So, Paul, I I very much appreciate what you've done here. Uh, the recording uh, obviously will be put to to great use uh, as far as being able to be used by people here in the lodge uh, to kind of get themselves acquainted uh, with what's going to happen that evening as well. You're welcome.